The chances of finding life on this newly discovered planet, Kepler-452b, are, well, we don't know what they are. We don't know. We don't even know if that planet has an ocean, an atmosphere. We don't know any of that stuff. All we know is that it's a little bigger than the Earth, you know, 60% bigger than the Earth. We know that it has a year that's 385 days. Our planet has a year of 365 days, so it's about the same. It's going around a star that's like the sun. We know all that. That's it. That's all we know. We think it's probably a rocky planet like the Earth is, so, you know, that's good. But beyond that, we don't know. So what are the odds that it has life? I don't know. I'll just guess. One in ten. But that's a guess. That's just me. And it's very hard to know. If we ever found extraterrestrial life, and I'm sure we will, and probably fairly soon, it's likely to be maybe some bacteria under the surface of Mars or maybe under the surface of one of Jupiter's moons. And if you could actually get to it and bring some of it back so you could study it, then the first thing you do is you say, well, what, what about it, uh, Bob? Does it have DNA? Right? Or does it have some other molecule? Right? You, you know, that kind of question. It would be really interesting to know. Because if it has DNA, then you say, well, there are only two possibilities. Either DNA is somehow the universe's best molecule for life, or this life is related to us. I mean, if the life comes from Mars, you know, you could say, well, maybe we're Martians, you know, that the Earth was contaminated by Martians a long time ago. So those are the kinds of questions you want to ask. You want to know, how is it built? Is it built in any way that's similar to the way life on Earth is built? Just about every day, somebody calls me up and says, hey, uh, you guys shouldn't be looking for E.T. because Stephen Hawking said it might be dangerous. Really? Actually, what Stephen Hawking was saying was not that it was dangerous to hear a signal from E.T., but to transmit anything to E.T. Because if you transmit something into the sky, somebody might, you know, find that signal, somebody aggressive. They, they now know where you are. They know you're here. And maybe they, they send some sort of rocket ship to Earth and blow you away or something. This is, you know, the sort of the friendly view of aliens. <laughs> well, I don't worry about that, because if you're going to worry about that, then you should worry about the fact we've been broadcasting into space since the Second World War. Uh, signals, mostly radar, but also television, FM radio. These are all signals that are going out into space, and any society that's potentially dangerous would be able to pick up those signals. So we've already been telling them about our presence here. So I don't worry too much about that, and even Stephen Hawking, would be the first one to champion the idea of listening to prove that somebody's out there. Interstellar space travel is, you know, you see it every night on television, you see it every week in the movies, right? Because otherwise you wouldn't have a story. Now, the facts are that our spacecraft go at about mm, 10 kilometers a second, some of them go a little faster, 15 kilometers a second. If that's the speed at which you're going, to go to the nearest other star, Alpha Centauri, would take you 75,000 years. That's a long trip. So you can say, yeah, but it's possible, isn't it? Of course it's possible. If you want to sit in a middle seat for 75,000 years eating peanuts, it's possible. But if you say, look, I want to get there faster, then you have to build a much faster rocket. And if you were a, an advanced society, I mean, you could probably build a faster rocket. I'm, I'm sure that's possible. But to, be able to build a, a rocket that could get you there in less than, say, 10 years, even to the nearest star, requires so much energy that it becomes very, very difficult. And the amount of energy that you know, the entire United States burns up in a century, that's the kind of energy required to get a rocket up to, say, half the speed of light. So it's, it's, it's a very difficult thing. It isn't to say it's impossible, but it's extraordinarily difficult. It's, not, it's, it's like saying, you know, uh, couldn't we just use some earth-moving equipment and eliminate the Alps? Well, in principle, you could. In practice, it's very hard. Another possibility, of course, would be to send uh, rockets where you have a thousand people on board, men, women, and, you know, they, they have children. They, and, 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 of course, they don't make it, but, you know, a hundred thousand years later, somebody arrives. Um, the uh, sociologists say that that's not really a great scheme unless you put everybody to sleep because otherwise they start fighting with one another and uh, they, uh, they very quickly after two generations they don't even remember what the mission is about they don't have the skills that the people who got on board the rocket have so it's very unclear that if you put 
generations, and you're talking about, you know, a thousand generations or more, putting a thousand generations <laughs> of humans into this rocket and sending them into space, that they're ever going to get anywhere alive. But 